started. Welcome to Million Women Mentors webinar as we celebrate Women's History Month and yes, International Women's Day. We not only celebrate, but we reflect on the research and on our action agenda. Just go quickly back to 1911 was our first International Women's Day. In 1980, our first presidential proclamation for Women's History Month. It was clearly by 1984 that we made the month a priority. And for the thousands and millions of us that are marching forward, we would say every day is Women's History Day, and every day is a day for progress. Thank you, Ashley. As we all look back and build our sisterhood with our male colleagues, we look back to a January of 2014 when we stood at the National Press Club and announced we were going to hit one million commitments to mentor, to sponsor, to push entrepreneurships, apprenticeships, and online mentorship by 2020. And we then celebrated this fall by hitting 2.3 million with 1 million completed mentorships. Now that means in four years we've made history, but we are just at a slow tipping point. If we get everyone with us, as Leslie Cruz and all of us say, we're going to hit 5 million by 2020. Gratitude is our attitude for everyone, the thousands in our communities and our states, in our private sector, public sector, our organizations that are working together in the U.S. and globally. And as clearly as Lorena Fembres, Ted Wells, as we kick this off with Tata Consulting, who helped build our website, we have, we have surpassed every expectation, and we've done it with infrastructure and commitment. Share with us that Me and Women Mentors is the gender movement that supports career pathways. We've achieved major milestones. And I think all of us agree is 2018 is the year of the women to drive success and massive engagement and participation. So the call today with our hundreds joining us represents our private sector leaders pushing for parity in the C-suite and the board up the system, but organizations Entrepreneurs, we thank you towards driving our action mentorship agenda. We are clearly looking in every industry and what they can do. Today you'll hear from our Women in Insurance Initiative, and today we also salute the Million Women Mentors Entrepreneurship Initiative chaired by Wells Fargo. Again, thanks to TCS for building with us the MWM website with Dane and Sheila Boynton, and to focus so much on the diversity for what we do. To Leslie, who's running with our team, with Ashley running communications, just think back as we get out weekly our Million Women Mentors news that's going to 10 to 20,000 leaders a week, and that think about with STEM Daily that's going to at least 25,000 out every day. Get us your stories so that we can salute you and what you're doing. The MWM blog series is extensive. The Global Committee for MWM is getting their release out today through a great blog and really use our Twitter, LinkedIn, and move forward to make certain that you thank everyone for getting their engagements, their numbers, and their commitments. And we thank the National Press Club and Bloomberg and Business Week, so many of the media that are joining us. 
One of the people that has done the most in this movement is Sheila Boynton, who is chairing our Million Women Mentors State Initiative that's giving training with Dane on use of our website and its immense resources. So Sheila, with so many of the states on the phone call, with your monthly call to the states, for what you've done in the four years with us and what you're doing going forward to everyone. And Ashley and I turn this over to Sheila Boynton. Sheila? Thank you so much, Edie. And happy International Women's Day to everyone out there from Chattanooga, Tennessee. It has been one of the highlights and honors of my life to work on the Million Mentors Movement as a woman engineer myself coming up through the ranks. It's just exciting to see the impact that this movement is having across the United States. So I'm going to take a few minutes now to share a little bit about kind of why we're doing some of what we're doing and a little bit about the nuts and bolts behind Million Women Mentors. As we will hear later on from some of our great initiatives, I think it's important that we're all grounded in the information around what we have been, why we're working on this. Um, so probably everyone understands that the STEM, that STEM skills are required for a lot of jobs in the country. And probably the number may be even more than 71%, but it certainly is growing, and so that is certainly a very important piece of this. But as Edie mentioned, you know, gender parity really also involves economic parity and making sure that women have opportunities to move economically. So, you know, we want to also highlight the fact that it's just not about getting the equal numbers, but the equal dollars, too. And, of course, we all understand that women earn 77 cents to a dollar for most jobs. But the great part about STEM jobs is that does start pushing us to an equity position where 92 cents to a dollar for most STEM jobs, and quite frankly, even for some of the technology jobs, it's more than that, should be dollar to dollar, but at least we're moving in the right direction when we look at STEM jobs. For women in the workforce, we're 50% of the workforce, yet we're only 24% of the STEM workforce. And I think one of the things that was most alarming to us as we launched the movement was that in the first 10 years of women being in STEM, 50% of them drop out. That was really something, so this wasn't only about getting more girls and women into the pipeline, it was also about keeping them there. And I think you're gonna hear a lot about ways that that is uh, continuing to grow. Um, our great partners at My College Options, who interviews about two-thirds of students across the United States, has actually tracked the fact that interest in STEM for girls at graduation is declining. And we've got to move the needle. I think that's continuing to elevate and be part of our movement, where we know STEM jobs are growing at a faster rate, that uh, the fastest growing jobs in America require STEM. Um, when we look at kids going into college, we also see a great disparity between girls and boys in terms of their uh, uh, stated interests, in terms of girls uh, recognizing an interest in STEM, only 15% and 44% for boys, even one to eight when we look at engineering and technology majors. This is really one of a critical, important thing for us to look at. You know, I'm, I'm an engineer, graduated in the early 80s, and, you know, we were always trending to kind of moving girls more and more into STEM and looking at these technology fields. But in the 10-year in the period where this was tracked through this research, they actually started to see that we were losing ground in computer science and other STEM fields. And, you know, while this country's been focused very much on STEM and education and project-based learning, all of these great things that are moving, that were aimed at moving the needle on that, we felt at, uh, that there might be another component that maybe hadn't been thought of. And I think that that is really the mentoring component. And so that is one of those things that we feel can really help to show girls and women what good STEM careers are, they can also tell them, yes, it's hard, but it's very rewarding work, and that there are meaningful careers in STEM that pay very well. Girls and women, AUW Research and others show us that we want careers where we're helping people. 
and, and making a societal impact. Quite frankly, millennials do anyway, and so, you know, we're really trending with the times. Um, mentors can help to show how women and how these great STEM careers actually help society. You know, do you think of an engineer or a technology job as being something that contributes positive to society? We don't always get girls all the way to the finish line helping them understand that. And that's part of what our movement is about. Hence, the Million Mentors Movement launched, as Edie mentioned, in 2014 as really the national movement to support engaging and getting more girls and women into the STEM pathways, keeping them there and growing them and continuing to grow that. So it's really been an exciting time for us. When we launched the movement, we really wanted to have some sort of broad goals and making sure that everything we did was kind of focused on these sort of principles here of helping getting higher percentage of girls in high school, et cetera, to say they were gonna pursue STEM careers, getting more girls majoring in STEM when they went to college, and certainly, as we mentioned earlier, increasing the percentage of women who not only um, stay in the STEM careers, but advance as well. We have what we call our kind of five pathways to mentor, but of course they're broad and much more uh, diverse now, but of course we're familiar with our face-to-face -face mentoring, online mentoring, texting, Skyping, all of that type of thing, as Edie mentioned, you know, internships and apprenticeships, helping companies think intentionally about how they encourage more girls and women to get into their internships, et cetera. And then, of course, at the companies where people are working, making sure that we're providing opportunities for girls and women, and particularly women as they're in the, the workplace, having a mentor who can help sponsor and elevate their career. We really also like to see about a 20-hour participation in, um, in mentoring, and again, I think of it as anything that's outside of a regular school day, so touch points during an entire year that help to really expose them to STEM, encourage them to stay in that space. As we mentioned, we're really thankful to Tata Consultancy Services for providing us with the opportunity to develop our portal. It's a great resource. There's lots of materials here that can help elevate the movement, and I encourage all of you to register and set up an account on here. And you know, we're not spending a lot of time on that today, but want you to be aware that we have this great portal. And as we mentioned, you know, we've had a really engaging state movement across the country where we have fantastic leaders, many of them who are on the call today, who have been really working to build activity and really elevate the movement from the ground up. So we can't say enough about all the work that the states are doing. Under the state movement, we've been very, very fortunate to connect, not to make this political, but connect to governors, lieutenant governors, and other leaders, senators, and others within the state who serve as honorary chairs across the state. Again, to just really give us a platform and another avenue to really champion for women in STEM in the state, encouraging the growth of women events and things of that nature. And speaking of that, we have across the country many, many events that feature Million Women Mentors every day. And so we have 150 events last year that were held across the United States that where MWN was represented. So if you're involved in their events in your community and you want MWM to be represented there and, and presented there, please let us know. Additionally, we actually create a state report that allows you to see what's going on. It's updated every fall. That's the one pager you can see your connection points. We also have resources that are available for you to um, use from our website. And again, you know, that's available to you on the website. And many of you know about our Be Counted campaign that allows you to count the mentoring that's going on. It's one of the really key avenues that helped us reach our million pledges that we did, we converted into completed last year. Our strategy, very simply, is to connect our mentors to women and girl-serving organizations because of, obviously, privacy and all those types of issues. And we do have the ability to do that within our web portal. And most recently, we are so thankful to our partnership with Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership, 
to allow us to help curate additional really fantastic mentoring opportunities for people. We want to make sure that we're able to give you robust mentoring opportunities in the community where you live so that you can get involved in Million Mama Mentors, not only from just talking about it, but really getting active with it. So how are some other ways that you can get started or continue to engage? We want to offer everybody a webinar anytime to learn a little bit more about Million Women Mentors in a more in-depth fashion. So I want to make sure you understand that. We also can connect you to your state leadership teams so you can hear more about what's going on within your state um, and certainly connect you to companies and our sponsors who have uh, mentors that are available to come out in the community. And then also our great girl-serving organizations, many of them TechBridge and Girls Inc. and others who do have opportunities for mentoring that we want to certainly get you connected to. So I want to really thank you so much for all the work that everybody is doing. It takes a village. We are the village. We're continuing to do this. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Carol Zacharias from QBE Insurance, who's going to talk about our great Women in Insurance initiative. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, can people hear me? Uh, Sheila, can I be heard? Hello? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Yes, good. Make sure. All right. Um, so the insurance industry is certainly driven by STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, from actuarial experts focusing on the math, from technology experts focusing on delivering operations um, and the delivery systems, if you will, in the, new, in the new age, and finance gurus focusing on underwriting and focus on profitability and so on. So there's no question that STEM drives this financial industry called insurance. However, in terms of gender parity, the insurance industry is on the cusp of change. Frankly, we're just getting started. Women drive the industry. We're not just getting started in that sense. We are 60% of the workforce, 1.6 million. We make up the front office. 62.5% of the underwriters are women. 62% of the claims adjusters are women. 46% of sales agents are women. We make up the back office. Over 85% of the clerks and claims and processing are women. So, excuse me, I have to take control. Sorry. Um, sorry. Um, so we are clearly in and of the insurance industry. However, there is, there's a great disparity in terms of leadership, uh, in terms of gender disparity. Only 8% of the uh, named inside officer positions are filled by women, and only 4.5% of those uh, in the women uh, realm are in the business roles. Only 17% of all directors in the industry are women, and frankly, that is skewed more toward mutuals than P&C. Only 10% of the top officer positions are women, meaning CEO, CFO, and so on. So we have a ways to go. Um, in, sorry, I'm having a problem with this. Bear with me. In terms of pay equity, on top of the leadership in equity, we have challenges as well. In 1951, women earned 64 cents on every dollar earned by men in the United States. By 2015, we had moved the needle up to 80 cents on the dollar for every dollar earned by men. In 2016, a report just done by Million Women Mentors showed that in women in insurance, they earned 62 cents for every dollar earned by men. We are back before where women were in 1951. The numbers are raw and the numbers are clear. If you take a look um, at the agency environment, you can see this inequity in greater detail. Female employees working for insurance agency earn 109% less than the male. Female owners and principals of agencies earn 61,000 and change less than their male counterparts. Male commercial lines managers earn 30% more than female counterparts. So the inequity on pay is certainly there. Now the interesting thing is you can actually see it as well going global. Uh, the UK passed something called the Equity Act of 2010, and it requires reporting on salary and data analytics related to salary by April 5th of 2018. So we are now ringing that bell in the UK. And what are they doing? The re reports are coming in. I've given some statistics on the slide here um, so you can see um, kind of what 
four uh, examples uh, have sort of come out looking like for companies, if you will. And as you can see that in terms of mean hourly pay, men are paid 25, 23, 20, 31, and 27 percent more than women, depending on which company you're in of those four. In terms of bonuses, men are paid 45 percent, 66 percent, 38, 64 percent, and 36 percent more than women. And if you look at the top quartile of individuals who make money in those companies, in one company, 72% are all men. Another one, 64%. Another one, 63%. Another one, 80% are men. Another one, 66% are men. In other words, the men are making the most money. So the bottom line is, clearly, we need to move women up. We need to move women up in this industry. The challenge is, frankly, though, that only 8% of insurance leaders surveyed indicated that they have some form of career development planning uh, or programming and so on for women. So that is simply not acceptable. So what do you do? In the, in, the, in the words of our infamous ED, you issue a call to action. We absolutely have to have a call to action to move this. And so Million Women Mentors is working on an initiative to be that change. We want this time period to be that tipping point. So what have they done and what have we all done? In 2017, they formed a consortium working with the Accord Organization, an industry-wide leading organization. And they they started out with two different initiatives, if you will. First, they wanted to get the data. Where are we? What, what, is the, what does this look like in the insurance industry? And they got it, and they put it in a report called Women in Insurance Leading to Action. It defines where the insurance currently stands in, case, in the area of gender disparities, and it puts out a case for an advancement. They released it at their summit in Washington, D.C. in the fall. And it was released at the Accord Conference in Boston, Massachusetts. It was one day apart in October. And Bill Peroni, the CEO of Accord, saluted the report, heralded the report, and shared an industry call to action. So we got it off the ground, if you will, in October with this enormous report and the announcement. The other thing they've been doing, we've all been doing, is working to collect insurance carriers who are interested in moving the needle forward. And in that, to that end, an honorary committee, an advisory committee was formed within the insurance industry um, uh, at the impetuous of Edie and the Million Moon Mentor Team and Accord. Insurance companies were invited to join in the call to action. And as of right now, we have eight companies committed and 14 companies are being talked to, if you will, and several of them are right on the edge. We're just working things out. So we're very, very much moving forward. So the 2018 is going to become the year of action. Now that 2017 was the year of getting it all together, if you will. We have a consortium conference call on the, in April, on April 12th. Um, in June, we actually have our first meeting here in New York City where we're at, we have a great program put together. In July, we have another consortium conference call to push this forward. And um, in the fall, they are going to be, we'll be issuing an update to the uh, report that Accord and Million Women Mentor is already working on. So the bottom line is the insurance industry has a long way to go, but we're started. So join our call to action. If anyone on the phone is related to the insurance industry, give us a call. Please join in the call to action. And with that, I'm going to turn it on over to our next um, presenter, um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mita Huggins, Chief Diversity Officer for Ford Motor Company. Um, I'm really excited to participate in today's forum to share perspectives around building a diverse pipeline, especially on a fort today such as today. I think many of us face challenges on what strategies or initiatives to pursue to excel in the space. I know there's probably a lot of great work all of you are doing, and today I'm going to share some thoughts and also some initiatives we're doing here within Ford. As we think about how to build a diverse pipeline, it's important to think about what are some of the barriers that may exist for women today in the workforce. I had a difficult time just choosing one, but wanted to share a few from my perspective that come to mind. First, there's a lack of exposure to STEM at an early age. Having females interested when they are in elementary and middle, middle school is important to keep them engaged in pursuing a career in STEM. The experience has to be unique, special, and have females feel excited to engage in STEM activities and ultimately have a career path. There also has to be time spent with another group that we tend not to focus on too much, which is parents. Parents help shape their children's path in life. We need to also provide them tools to have engaging conversations with their children on what it is like to have a career in STEAM or STEM. 
This is even more important for those parents who are not in a STEM career, them, career themselves. The next one is, a, is, the second one is that we are probably all familiar with is not having enough female role models, especially in STEM for younger females to look up to and guide and mentor others. We've all heard the research indicating that female, females are more prone to remaining with the company if they see career development opportunities, but also they need to see other female leaders in higher level positions and in turn can see themselves having a long-term career. The other challenge is that since the problem of the lack of role models isn't gonna be fixed overnight, how can we change the narrative for females to feel that they can be future role models even if they don't see others in their organization or the company? And that's one of the biggest challenges out there. And then finally, engagement from some, but not all on developing a solution. <clears throat> one of the myths that exist is that since it's a problem regarding females, they, meaning females, know how to solve it. I think we all know that isn't the case. Moreover now, we need to start seeing engagement from everyone to make changes to eliminate barriers. There is still opportunity in this space for all individuals to be engaged 100% on supporting strategies, initiatives, and even just taking the time to understand how can they actually help. With Ford and like many others, we continue to spend a lot of time on how how do we continue to build our pipeline for females? Keeping the barriers in mind that I just referenced, there are a few initiatives that I want to highlight that we're really proud on that we're working on. Partnering on STEAM programs has been integral for us to build a diverse pipeline early on. We have a group of employees that are dedicated to assess and develop STEAM programs. We also have hundreds of dedicated volunteers to help drive these programs within the community as well. When assessing who we should partner with, one of the main criteria we use is, well, this partnership build not just any pipeline, but a diverse pipeline. There are many we are involved with, but a few I want to highlight today are, um, we partnered with the Michigan Council of Women in Technology, which supports over 900 girls in grades five to 12 with specific programs, uh, namely Get It, Girls Exploring Together in Information Technology, which is an after-school program. Girls Rock IT, which is sponsoring Girl Scouts and Brownie Troops to complete technology badges. Camp Infinity, which is week-long summer camps for middle school girls. And then Girls Solve IT, which is a hands-on competition for girls in grade five through eight. We also partner with colleges and universities that we recruit at on STEAM programs. For example, we partake and in introduce a girl to engineering day at Michigan State. And this is for girls between grades four and eight we spend a day rotating through five different hands-on engineering activities, which are led by students, faculty, and industry leaders. We also are partnering with Michigan, Center Center, Michigan Science Center on the STEMINISTA project, which is for girls in grades four through eight who have access to day-long seminars and week-long camps and competitions. And finally, destination imagination. Build your future, build your, build your forward of the future challenge and this is challenging students to design a solution to help make future cities more accessible and efficient with a focus on smart mobility. These programs and many others help lay the foundation for developing diverse talent early on, and hopefully that talent will potentially take on a career within STEM. We also continually look at unique hiring initiatives to leverage diverse talent. Last year, we launched the STEM reentry program and partnered with the, with the Society of Women Engineers and iRelaunch for individuals that were out of the workforce for an extended period of time. The program's designed to have employees come on board on a temporary basis, like an internship. And it's an opportunity not only for the company to assess the individual before they convert them to full time, but also an opportunity for the employee to assess if this is a career they really wanna pursue within Ford. During the temporary time frame, we provide a structured program to ensure the employees have all the tools they need to be successful. This entails professional development, a peer buddy, a mentor, and senior female leader exposure so they can see other female role models. We've had individuals who've been out of the workforce for as little as two years and others for more than 20 years. Some would look at this break as a disadvantage, disadvantage and we looked at it as an opportunity by leveraging an untapped talent pool, especially in the area of STEAM. In turn, we hired several females in, our manu in your manufacturing, information technology, and product development team, and are now looking to expand this year beyond STEAM for, for uh, across all the functional units. 
I spoke earlier about engagement of all. We've done some work in this space by engaging the majority, which is men, in conversations around how to engage in eliminating barriers for women. We leveraged Catalyst for a pilot last year on Men Advocating Real Change, MARC program. I'm sure many of you have heard about it and even used extensively. For us, I have to say, it was a big deal. The training program was an eye-opening and we piloted it within a small group in one of our functional areas. By having that one training course, a few things happened afterwards. They, the leaders who participated in MARC, are having constant dialogue about their learning and have made it a standard agenda item for them to talk about with their teams. We have men now actively engaged within the women employee resource groups. And finally, the leaders have talked about it in every form they sit in across various functional units. We are now developing a strategy on how can we expand this on a broader scale on an, and, and globally across various functional units. So the exponential growth of this one session was impactful across the entire company. The final area I want to touch on is what companies should focus on going forward, especially around the area of access for females to higher leadership levels. We have to have good mentors for females, individuals that can provide feedback, lay of the land, and can give them career advice. But we also need to provide sponsorship for females. This goes beyond mentorship. But as a leader, for instance, that can be the strong advocate for that female, the person that pulls for them and has a strong voice when openings pop up. More and more companies are shifting their focus to this ideology and differentiating what a sponsor is versus a mentor. Having development programs within an organization is important to grow talent, including diverse talent. The development programs can be focused on all, but also leveraging programs that may be for females specifically can help them on their journey to the C-suite. There are many organizations externally that do this work in this space to support companies by providing unique programs for diverse, including female talent, or some of you may have your own programs that you've designed that have been effective. The last item is training, and this isn't just any training. We're probably all used to the online training or the classes that you sit in and are more compliance related or check the box. But we have to focus not just on compliance, but commitment. And what I mean by commitment is that individuals lead training with a sense of purpose and a sense to do something better and wanna make a difference without being forced to to commit to specific actions they're going to do to make a better world, especially in the space of diversity and inclusion is important with this kind of training. With that, I hope you found the perspective shared insightful and helpful as we all are on this journey to building a diverse and inclusive organization. I'd like to introduce our next presenter who is Dorothy Schobert Sargent, <coughs> Managing Director, End User Product <coughs> Credit Suisse, who will talk about progress in the boardroom. Thank you. Thank you, Mita, for the insight. And good morning and good afternoon from Zurich in Switzerland. Thank you for the honor to join this conversation today as we collectively commit on International Women's Day to press for progress. My name is Dorothy Shavit, and I'm an electrical engineer by background and manager within Credit Suisse's Information Technology Group, privileged to be working with gifted individuals across the world to provide core IT services for the bank. And I'm the proud mother of two a girl and a boy. Given my experiences of studying electrical engineering in the late 90s and my role as a manager, I'm passionate about diversity and keen to ensure equal opportunities as I've seen the benefit of allowing each one to live out their strengths. And particularly as a mother, I've grown an understanding of how education and role models greatly influence aspirations and bring out the best of us. I'm proud to share with you today the encouraging and empowering insights that the CS Research Institute study, Diversity in the Boardroom, Reward for Change, has highlighted. The study, published at the end of 2016, looked at how one of many diversity factors, namely the only published visible one, gender, influences the result of over 3,400 companies across all industries and across the world. And the overwhelming good news is diversity has a very positive business case and efforts to promote it are paying off. Yes, progress has been slow, but important to note the five key takeaways of the study. First of all, companies with more female executives in decision-making positions 
continue to generate stronger market returns and superior profits. Second, diversity in the boardroom has been growing steadily across the globe, 16% across the last two years, with particularly Europe excelling. So it has been highlighted that the push and the pull for the boardroom has left gaps in senior management too. Third, looking at differences in industries, clearly consumer industries do better than producer industries, which often are linked more closely to STEM, but evident is the culture drives diversity, not the industry. The study also looked at two myths, namely the queen bee myth, and contrary to conventional wisdom, women in leadership roles do not actively exclude other women from promotions to top management. And also, the glass cliff myth, no evidence was found that women are given the tougher roles when being put on a board. Regardless of board level or not, these results are encouraging and highlight through available public data points that progress is being made on diversity in general and that the opportunities are real for everyone at every level. There we go. Given the low starting point for the positive developments over the last years, we need to continue to focus on equal opportunities and diversity and build on the success factors to date. Success factors highlighted are drawn from the diversity in the boardroom study and also experiences made at Credit Suisse, where we are fortunate that our leadership understands and appreciates that a diverse or diversity of voices and life experiences allow for the best solutions and innovations, especially in the technology world, which I represent. So, what got us here and how can we continue to support the positive trajectory? One, to challenge the unconscious bias so that we can identify the best talent, recruit and promote fairly. And if you have not come across Iris Bonet's <coughs> work, she, she's a professor of behavioral science at Harvard Kennedy School and also sits at the board of directors for Credit Suisse. It is eye-opening. It's called What Works? Gender Equality by Design and I highly, highly recommend it for everyone to study it. Second of all, we also need to look at investing into our internal talent pipeline and actively finding opportunities for our talents to grow into new opportunities. We are looking at mentorships, coaching, career networks to ensure that the best talent can move forward and that women are actively promoted into next positions. And last but not least, we set targets or quotas. We've been encouraged by Europe's progress that has shown that quotas do work, and after all, if we do not set out goals, how can we ensure that the progress on the right path and in the right direction has been made? What do we need to do more of? Research shows that to truly affect positive change and tackle the pipeline challenge, we must start early, and earlier than focusing on internships and graduates <coughs> when girls make it out of universities. Girls need positive role models in their schools and in life so that they feel encouraged to pursue a wide range of careers and that especially in the sciences, technologies, engineering and mathematics, the careers are attainable, attractive and rewarding. So do join us in reaching out to schools, launch programs to partner with schools and be there as role models. And as you listen in today, I encourage you all to join me and the family of Credit Suisse in pressing for progress, to advocate for equal opportunities and to challenge bias, to be the change that we want to see in the world and be role models for the talents, especially of the next generations, so that the rates of STEM careers will grow and that we see the girls not influenced by bias in their pursuit of their strengths. And also join me and offer your support to the women in your work life as they move along in their careers and their pursuit of positions of leadership. It's through finding interesting work and having strong role models that we can increase diversity and help our girls be propelled to become future female technologists, to reach senior levels and beyond. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Doro. With that, we're going to pass it on to our next presenter, Bethann Bovino, who is with S&P Global and talking about the key to unlocking the U.S. GDP. Hi there. Thanks, everyone, for having me on. I also want to give an apology for my colleague, Jason Gould. He's the Vice President and Global Head of Strategic Relations and Partnerships at S&P Global. He, um, he's been technical difficulties. I've been sending emails back and forth to try and get him on, but there's just been some difficulty. So uh, he sends his regrets, and I'm, I'll keep sending him emails uh, to tell him how it's going. Um, so, so one of the reasons why we're on, um, I, I'm the U.S. Chief Economist at S&P Global, and what we're looking at and what an analysis that we did um, was on looking at the impact of women in the workplace and what that means for the economy. Um, the overarching message that we came from doing this research was that if we increased women's participation and retention in the U.S. workforce, if it were to increase, there would be significant economic benefits along with societal ones, and that an increase, and it would also increase economic competitiveness that would uh, be realized over a few decades. Now, why did we study this? Why, why did this come up at, at this point in time for my team? Well, one thing to keep in mind is that the labor participation rate now uh, in the United States is at a 40-year low. Ironically, that's when, that goes back to the 1970s when many women worked in the workforce in the early 70s. Um, it's been increasing, um, but you've seen a drag on that, uh, the, the overall labor participation rate. And one of the big reasons is because retirees, which are generally not coming back. We had earlier uh, reduced our estimate for potential long-term growth in the United States. It was closer to 3% 10 or 15 years ago. Now we say it's going to be under 2%. Um, so how can we change that? Uh, one thing that we looked at is given that labor in the United States, labor in anywhere, in any economy, is largely um, the most essential, um, most, the most essential resource for an economy to grow, uh, we wanted to look at how could we cre increase labor to supply, and we looked at women. What we've also seen now is that women, while we did see women in 1990, prime-aged women, that's between 25 and 54 years of old, of, of, of 54 years old, the uh, prime-aged women labor participation rate, 1990 and earlier on, used to be at the top. We were at the top of the 22 advanced OECD countries. But now, as of, as of going out to 2016, we're near the bottom. And in terms of optimizing what is considered to be an economy's most valuable research, we're failing. So what we looked at, uh, what are the reasons why this is the case and how can we change the tide? One thing that we looked at, in particular that's been talked about on this uh, uh, right now already with my colleagues on this call, is that the biggest obstacle for women um, to overcome is children both bearing and rearing. And now I would like to say that it's not now, given that we do have an aging population, it's not just children anymore, we have elder care to take into account. And I want to give credit to men who have really stepped up to, play, to the plate in taking care of rearing children and also um, elder, elder parents. But women still do take into account, do, do take the lion's share of that responsibility. Um, we looked at S&P and tried to figure out what we could do in there. Oh, another thing to take into account, while women do take the care, care of the responsibility of ch children, ch child care, and also family care, the United States is the only country in the OECD that doesn't provide income support during maternity or paternity, per, paternity leave by law. And for single mothers, a full day for an infant, infant eats up over 40% of her immediate income. That's a big weight on that, on that woman and also women. Interesting thing to also note that this is the 25th year of the Family Leave Act and would be an interesting time to tweak that act for, um, for, for today's times. Now, the thing that we wanted to look at in here is that what we found is that if we did increase uh, entry and retention into women, of women into the American workforce, of course, if they choose to, because it is about choice for a woman uh, to make the choice between um, rearing children and staying at home or deciding to go to work. Um, but if a woman does choose to do that, what we found was that if we increased women's, uh, women retention of women in the workforce, we found that the U.S. economy could, could add potentially 5 to 10 percent to nominal GDP in just a few decades. That productivity boost would increase U.S. economic competitive edge to be realized 
uh, for, for um, over the next 10 decades, for the next few decades. We also did a study to look at what's the comparison between what if the U.S. did actually increase in terms of women's participation rate back in the 70s till to now. We took a nice, um, kind of a nice study to look at compared us to Norway. We didn't just use Norway, there were other countries to use, but one of the reasons why we did that was because the labor participation rate for women in early in the 1970s, early 1970s, was about the same for the U.S. and Norway. U.S. climbed higher, but Norway took off much faster. And what we found is, is that what if over the last three decades, women's participation rate had increased at a faster pace, similar to Norway, for example. We found that the U.S. would be $1.6 trillion bigger today than it, than it is right now. That means about $5,000 for each person in the United States. Also wanted to point out the potential societal gains that women give um, if we were to bring them into the workforce. Women save more and invest more than in their children than men. Um, and this is a way, particularly for the saving, given that we're seeing an aging population and the government needs to pay for this, having them uh, women work could certainly help ease that uh, pressure on the government as well. Um, I wanted to talk about a few ideas we came out. Education was talked out by um, talked about by a few women on this call already. So I, would, I certainly would agree with many of the things that have been said. And we look here in terms of exploring how to increase women um, women participation in some of these fields, like STEM, for example, um, uh, late, um, down the road. One thing that we did look at some things that were done in the early 70s. Uh, Title IX, for example, guaranteed that no one can legally be excluded from participation in and an education program merely on the basis of gender, that actually made some strides in terms of what women are doing today. Also, the passage of the Women's Education Equity Act also gave support to assist schools into turning the tide and being increasingly aware of gender bias in curriculum and, you know, in curriculum. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those, those, um, those programs have been dramatically cut, and that's something to consider. Um, one thing to think about when I talk, when these women have, uh, women who had just spoken earlier had talked about getting women into education or into STEM, for example, I kind of wonder what, what would have happened to the U.S. economy if, you know, how many of those Alberta Einsteins or Carla Sagans in STEM uh, did we miss? And that means not just for those women and those, and those women's families, but for the economy as a whole. Um, I don't want to say that education alone is not the cure of. There's many other things that we need to take um, to consider. One, of course, is the time off penalty. That certainly as women climb the ladder, um, time off penalty because doesn't just stop at childbearing; it continues throughout the throughout the ch children's years until they're even 18 or or older. Those time off penalties hurt that woman's prog uh, woman's uh, woman's opportunities, and of course, pay uh, pay increases are hurt as well. We we looked at all these things and we came up with something because this this is such a big subject, and and there are many ways to take this. One thing that we wanted to introduce was what if for policymakers who make a lot of decisions, and I believe there was already mentioned that. Many of the policymakers are men, not women, um, who don't have a personal account of what is the case. Um, we looked at the question of what if we could introduce, what if there was some kind of, say, score, something like the Congressional Budget Office uh, CBO-like score that would be able to give, give a sense for policymakers of the potential impact of legislation on women and their participation in a workforce, in a sense, sort of a cost-benefit ratio for such factors such as child care and the overall overall economic impact, including job creation. Now, I want to say that this is something that's been done by the CBO before. They did that on the ACA, um, the impact of ACA on jobs. What they found was that more than 2 million people may decide not to work by 2023, and it wasn't because of lost jobs. It wasn't that they would lose their jobs, but it was besides that they may decide to work less because they have other options. This could be something to explore for, for, um, uh, for this uh, for this area as well. Last thing I wanted to say, uh, my colleague who couldn't join on the on the call, there's something that he wanted to say about what we're doing at S&P Global, and I can talk personally on that as well. Um, he wanted to say that our corporate responsibility at S&P Global, our program for corporate responsibility, is looking to carry more of the work that is focused in the paper that Jason and I wrote, which I hope everybody has access to, and wants to take the conversation at S&P Global to many of our domestic locations like Houston and Denver 
and then also globally, like Singapore and London. This is just the start, and we and we expect it to continue uh, further down the road. Um, but we wanted to let you um, know that as well. And I can stop there. I believe I'm going to pass this on to Deb Campbell, the Senior Director and Consultant of Global Marketing Services at Catalyst. Now, thank you so much. Thank you, Beth, and I appreciate that, um, passing out the, the baton. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about inclusive workplaces and how crucial they are, not only for realizing women's potential, but if you think back to what Sheila said earlier this morning, um, that women are not being attracted to STEM roles and they're not staying in STEM roles. I think she said a, a, a statistic of 50% of women are leaving STEM roles over the course of 10 years. And so inclusive workplaces are going to be really critical to keeping women in those STEM roles. Next slide, please. So I'd like to start by briefly telling my own story. I graduated with a computer science degree in the mid-1980s with a specialty in operating systems and compilers. And in my first years on the job, I was a highly technical developer, and I loved the work. But I was the only woman in my research and development department, and I got the message that I didn't fit in. I felt like an outsider. The guys, including my manager, met to discuss projects at work without me and went out for beers after work without me. I wasn't like them. And equally important, I didn't fit the stereotype of the highly technical developer, you know, the anti-social geek kind of stereotype, as I'm outgoing and I enjoy collaborating with people. So assuming that this was the standard against which I was going to be measured, I thought I would never fit in. I was experiencing unintentional gender bias and as a result, feeling like the other. So unfortunately, at a young age, with no one mentoring or guiding me, and my management team and colleagues making me feel excluded, I quit. So I stayed in the high-tech industry for 16 years. I moved out of R&D, out of my STEM role after two. While my career has evolved in ways that have been successful and incredibly satisfying to me, I have always wondered, what could I have contributed? if I stayed a developer. One of the reasons I work for Catalyst is to ensure that fewer women, including women of color, make the same decision I did. That instead, they feel included in their teams and organizations and have people guiding them to stick with a career in STEM. Next slide, please. For those of you who might not be familiar with Catalyst and um, Thank you, Mita, for uh, the wonderful things you said about us. I just want to say a few words uh, about who we are. So Catalyst has been working with companies to evolve workplaces so that they work for women for over 50 years. Our mission is to accelerate progress for women through workplace inclusion. And we partner with our supporters to drive change with our research, our tools, and our proven solutions. You can check out the research and tools that I refer to today on our website, catalyst.org. Next slide. So I told you my story of feeling like the other. I'm a white woman. Women of color in STEM roles experience even more challenges in male predominant organizations. So what does it mean to be an other in the workplace? Well, we all have multiple identities that define both how we see ourselves and how others perceive us. And these include attributes such as gender, race, and ethnicity. And they're lenses through which we view the world. The more different we are and feel from our work group or our workplace overall, the more we may feel like the other at the table. Catalyst research called Feeling Different, Being the Other in U.S. Workplaces, illuminates how folks with multiple dimensions of diversity can feel, and difference, can feel even more different, more like an outsider. But it also highlights the career disadvantages of being different. If we experience being the other, we're less likely to have high-level mentors, less likely to receive promotions, and more likely to downsize our aspirations. 
our most recent Catalyst research called Day-to-Day -day Experiences of Emotional Tax Among Women and Men of Color in the Workplace points to the long-term toll, or as we call it, emotional tax, that experiences of inclusion and bias can take on the well-being of women of color. Catalyst's latest STEM research demonstrates that even women in business roles experience exclusion in STEM-related industries, highlighting that companies in these industries would benefit from more inclusive cultures. Next slide, please. So inclusive cultures make a difference, both for attracting women into STEM and for keeping women in STEM roles. In our organizations, diversity is a fact, but inclusion is a choice. The reality is the business benefits of diversity aren't realized unless there is inclusion. Our research highlights that feeling included is the simultaneous experience of feeling valued for your uniqueness and having a sense of belonging on your team. It's a balance. Too much emphasis on your uniqueness and you will feel like the other. Too much emphasis on belonging and you feel you have to cover or hide your differences. So what's a fundamental way to achieve an inclusive culture? Next slide, please. Inclusive behavior. Our research called Inclusive Leadership, the View from Six Countries, identifies four key behaviors from leaders that universally make employees feel included. We call them the each behaviors, empowerment, accountability, courage, and humility. Empowerment is about enabling your direct reports to develop and excel. Accountability is demonstrating confidence in your direct reports by holding them responsible for performance that they can control. Courage is acting on your convictions and principles, even when it requires personal risk-taking. And humility, among others, is seeking contributions of others to overcome your own natural limitations. While these behaviors were identified in leaders, it's clear that anyone can use them to make their workplace environment more inclusive. Next slide, please. So let me wrap up with some actions to make your workplace more inclusive of women, including women of color, in STEM roles. First, listen. We know that words have power and that silence is an action. Creating a workplace in which all employees feel they belong and that their differences are appreciated may seem challenging when those differences are related to gender, race, and ethnicity. Yet the sensitivity of those subjects highlights how important it is to openly talk about them. Individual actions that you can take include learn from various Catalyst tools how to encourage dialogue across race and gender, and how to address potential conversation roadblocks in those dialogues. Promote people's individual expressions of difference. Share your struggles and be open to being challenged and accepting of another person's perspective. Learn. Learn that employee experiences matter. Your experience as an employee impact your productivity, innovation, and intent to stay, and so too for everyone else in your organization. Organizational actions that you can take to learn are to assess your organization's cultural values and norms on a regular basis to reveal and then close gaps based on gender, race, and ethnicity. Then track and monitor the outcomes of that assessment. And pay attention to how employees' experiences differ. Ensuring consistency across the organization as you implement policies, practices, and talent management systems. Also, link up. I like to envision us all linking arms when I think of this one. Ensure that all women and men work together as allies for positive change because involved and committed employees can amplify inclusion within your company. Organizational and individual actions you can take are to hold facilitated conversations with employees to find out what's working, what's not, and why and find ways for employees across all diversity dimensions to own your organization's inclusion efforts. And finally, lead. Leaders need to take the lead, but all of us can be involved. 
Organizational actions include educate and train all employees in inclusive leadership behaviors. Individual actions you can take include paying attention to whose voices are being heard, whose opinions are being validated, and if anyone is being ignored during meetings or informal interactions. And encourage your team members to have each other's backs by offering protection and support when colleagues encounter challenges. All of us have a role to play in creating workplaces where everyone is valued, is heard, and has fair opportunities to succeed. And these kinds of inclusive workplaces will be the ones that attract women to STEM roles and to keep them in STEM roles. Now I'd like to turn it over to um, Priscilla Christopher of Boeing, who will be talking about mentoring for women in technology. Thank you so much, and um, definitely a, a difficult presentation to follow, but also one and a message to build upon um, as we look at today's focus. Definitely happy International Women's Day. Um, you know, very honored to be here on uh, behalf of Boeing and uh, behalf of everyone else here who's taken the time out of their days, um, be it that time is the one thing that we can never get back in life and really um, promoting what we need to do today to help drive change. I myself, as well as uh, my Vice President, Lakshmi Warpu, are representing women engineers in the industry today. Um, we are proud to stand amongst the distinguished women who have helped shape and transform the industry to what it is today. So um, something to be recognized here. Um, so what is STEM and what does it mean uh, to Boeing and IT today? Um, STEM, Women in technology um, are enabler for change. Uh, progression, evolution, delivery are all key indicators for the success of what we're doing. Um, Boeing is dedicated to addressing the need for women to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, women have played an important role in the history of Boeing. As part of the company's inception in 1916, um, you know, obviously founder William Boeing hired a seamstress we most commonly know as Rosie the Riveter to stitch together linen wings for the early B&W seaplanes. Rosie, amongst others, in 1918 made up 25% of the early company's workforce. Of course, a couple years later, um, Helen Holcomb joined Boeing as the first women in an engineering department. Uh, as we continue to look at the progression of women in the workforce at Boeing, um, just looking back again, 1942, 15% of women, um, percent of the employees were women, and by 1944, that percentage grew to over 40%. Um, since that time, and taking us back to the current state of where the company is at and where the industry is at, um, you know, Boeing has actively worked to diversify our workforce. Um, you know, over the past five years, we've obviously engaged in um, many charitable trusts um, and, and building um, over 3.6 million young women in STEM across the globe um, through the workforce that we have today. Um, just this last year, um, Boeing Defense, Space and Security CEO Leanne Carrot was named amongst the most powerful women in business. Joan Robinson Berry, Boeing's uh, South Carolina Vice President and General Manager, received the Aerospace Achievement Award. Lakshmi Warpu, our Vice President of Business and Supply Chain Systems, nominated amongst the, the 100 top corporate women leaders of 2017. Okay. The perception, foundation, and vision of STEM is clearly evolving, not just through awareness, but through those who are willing to challenge and change the field. When we're looking at diversity, again, specifically talking about women in technology, um, you know, obviously the, there's a strong importance around the awareness um, and what this looks like to companies um, in the technology industry today. Um, it's through diversity that the IT industry will truly transform. Uh, if the most of you can imagine 3D, you know, 4D holograms, mobile solution, digital communication was once an imagination um, portrayed in movies. Today, 
science behind robotic surgical equipment, virtual reality for shop floor in the automobile or aerospace industry is a foundation for how we serve the community. As we keep a close eye on how the IT industry is evolving, you'll see that the opinion of a gap is on the path to be transformed into what's known as an opportunity. While the numbers may show that the physical presence of women in technology is not where most would hope, the contributions as women in technology today um, we provide um, and the potential we have in the market is infinite. Um, it is our responsibility, um, those on the call, uh, those whom we lead to drive this awareness um, and thus result in transforming the mindset around the gap and opportunity. Keeping on the path for, for diversity um, and then bringing it back at the Boeing level, veterans in STEM is a huge focus for us. Um, I'm sure you all have seen, you know, posted out there publicly, um, Michael Ford, um, you know, I quote, it takes the best and the brightest talent to achieve creative, innovative solutions and ideas. Veterans are an essential part of our inclusive workplace that will drive Boeing's future success. This is an opportunity we need to take, we need to not only keep on their horizon, but quickly capture. Um, it is clear that the interest exists, and it is equally clear that the bridge between identification of female veterans in technology and the acquisition of said talent needs a restructure to not only exist, but drive results. And that's what that messaging is about. Finally, um, just wrapping up, you know, there is a clear need for women in technology. Um, the need is present, it's vibrant, and it's real. Um, a couple years ago, uh, statistics had, had shown here publicly that you know, less than 20% of our Fortune 500 companies had uh, female or women CIOs or CTOs. As we make our way through 2018 and beyond, it's clear that we need to continue to strengthen our messaging, our partnership, and our channels for bringing opportunities to the surface and executing on them. We have an opportunity here to help connect the dots and ensure that we continue to raise each other up. And I want to close um, the portion on Boeing here with, with one remark from Lakshmi Ellis Warp, who she really wanted to be here today. Uh, but um, I'm speaking on, on behalf as her executive chief of staff and global transformation leader. Um, we must raise each other so we can raise together. We must raise each other so we can raise together. This is our mantra as we drive change for 2018, and I hope it serves those on this call just as well. So thank you for letting me uh, come here and, and talk with you today and, and capture some solid knowledge and feedback. And um, I want to go ahead and, and pass it on here to our next our presenter. Next. Great, thanks Priscilla. Leslie Cruz here. Um, and thank you to Priscilla, thank you to Deb, Beth Ann, Doro, Mita, Carol, Sheila, and Edie, all of our participants. And to all of you uh, who have joined us on this call, our 107th International Women's Day celebration. What an important time to come together to celebrate our collective action and accomplishments and align on our movement moving forward. As we look ahead, I'll go ahead and close our call out by sharing some upcoming activities for Million Women Mentors as well as some suggested calls to action so we can all continue to come together to hold each other up and accelerate our impact. Okay, at STEM Connector and Million Women Mentors, we're so thrilled to continue to build on the momentum that, we, that you all have just heard across our broader membership, our states, our corporations, and as we look to increase opportunities for women on career paths, we wanted to share some upcoming additional opportunities for you to get involved with across Million Women Mentors that are on the horizon. First, be on the lookout for a refreshed newsletter. We'll have specific resources and tools to help your mentoring efforts, as well as additional insights and success stories that we've extracted from our movement, from the states, from our corporations, and the broader membership. I have to admit, it is a rare occurrence that I don't get an email from Sheila Boynton about all of the amazing work and activity and impact going on in the States. 
just this week, I was blown away by what is happening in Illinois, and then equally blown away by a summary of all of the activity happening in Texas, as well as our other states. Visit MillionWomenMentors.com to sign up for the newsletter if, you have, if you're not already a subscriber. Additionally, we'll be creating more webinars like this one um, for our network to hear about Million Women Mentors initiatives. Upcoming next is on June 6th, we'll have our Leadership Circle webinar featuring the leaders of our various initiatives who are going to share updates from our global, our corporate, our states, entrepreneurship, women in insurance, among other efforts. Later on, we'll have a State of the State celebration and showcase on November 7th. And in addition to that, what's not on the screen, I will highlight, I'm excited to unveil and announce that we'll be offer, also offering quarterly mentor training and best practice webinars for our broader membership. We hope that through these webinars, you all are gonna be connected to the larger movement and continue to drive change within your own organizations and communities. Members are also invited to attend our annual award summit and gala on October 25th in Washington, D.C., where we'll ground attendees in the importance of the movement while celebrating the successes that are affecting young women across the globe. In addition to these events, I did want to share some additional enhancements quickly that you will see coming out across the membership. First, we are going to continue, as Sheila mentioned, to add mentoring opportunities through local nonprofits and organizations on our website that is run by Tata Consultancy Services. Second, as uh, we will go ahead and continue to advance the efforts of the states by connecting our corporate sponsors and others to these local communities. I always say connecting local initiatives to the national movement is the thing that spurred Million Women, million women Mentors on from the beginning and that we'll continue to do. And lastly, we're gonna go ahead and I'm excited to also unveil that we're working in partnership with a number of groups to review and provide research on the effectiveness of mentoring, right? We all care about what is the impact? How is this delivering? How are we delivering change? And we'll go ahead and provide some case-based research and information to bolster and continue to support your overall efforts. Okay, where do we go from here? There is so much goodness going on today that should be inspiring and motivating, but as, as we all know, and as Edie started us out, every day should be International Women's Day. We've got three suggested call to actions for each one of us to consider after this call. First, commit. When I look back on the collective impact of Million Women Mentors, Change happens when commitments are made. For me, commitments are the catalyst to drive change. Here's what I propose we do. If everyone on this call commits to getting just one more person involved in Million Women Mentors, we can increase our impact by thousands. If each person commits to getting one more person each month, think about how that multiplies even more. If each member organization gets involved, that can represent hundreds, if not thousands, of mentors or mentees. And it's not just about women mentoring women, right? Think about what we heard earlier from our speakers. We need to push beyond stereotypes. Cultural shifts require everyone getting on board. This means men, boys, individuals of color, women of all ages. No one can be left out of the conversation if we want to go ahead and drive action. Bring them in on the discussion. Make it okay for anyone to ask questions, to learn, to empathize, and to understand. And lastly, we need to actually pause every so often and celebrate our success. One common denominator I think that represents each and every one of us on this call is that we are driven, goal-oriented people. All too often, we don't stop to celebrate and reflect on our accomplishments. Each woman or girl who stays on a STEM career, pursues a leadership opportunity, or increases her own confidence in her ability is a victory. Let's not forget that. It is by appreciating the work of those before us and being proud of the work that we have done that will give us the energy to move forward. Do we have time for questions? 
We do. Thank you so much, Leslie, for wrapping us up. You may notice in your WebEx that there is a section where you can type in a Q&A. So if you want to take a moment, we have about 13 minutes that we can direct some questions to some of our panelists or to us here at, in the room at STEM Connector. So if you start bringing in questions, I know a lot of the questions that we're seeing right now are simply whether the slides will be available. <laughs> so I can definitely promise that we will be sharing this webinar on our YouTube channel at STEM Connector. And additionally, we will be sending a follow-up email with information about our panelists and allowing you opportunities to we'll answer some of these questions and we can share the slides. So answering that question right off the bat, because I know throughout this a lot of people were really interested in getting to dive a little bit deeper into some of our panelists' work, which is really exciting. So I'm going to take a second and just look at some of the questions as you're typing them in. And if they ha we have one that can be directed as a panelist, please write that in the question and I will take a look at those and see where we have them. Okay, most of the questions, again, are on um, the how to get information to the slide and how to share it with your broader community. So we'll make sure we follow up with that. So again, a generous thank you to all of our amazing presenters for sharing your stories, your insights, your commitments. For those of you that made us part of your Women's Day program, thank you for joining us. I hope the messages and insights will feed into the rest of your International Women's Day program and activities back across your companies and your organizations. For those participants who joined us just as, as individuals, as part of the larger Million Women Mentors movement, thank you. Thank you for making us part of your day. We all hope that the ideas and call to action resonate. We'll spur some of your own ideas that you'll share back with us about what you're going to do in your local communities and your organizations to carry forward across your day, across your week, across the months to come. High-quality mentoring relationships have been proven to be one of the most influential levers of our movement. Keep going. Let's all find one more person, male or female, who has a passion for this effort to join us and keep driving forward. Let's celebrate our successes and applaud our accomplishments, and together we'll advance the movement, we'll amplify our collective voices to inspire, to build confidence for girls and women to get on and stay on career pathways. Edie, any final parting thoughts? Leslie Cruz, thank you, and to Ashley and to Sheila and all. What an amazing array, if you listen to the corporate and the organizations, the research studies that back it all up, the insurance project. We want to make sure you've got not only the YouTube, and thank you, Ashley, for taking the lead of our amazing communications. We also want to make sure you've got any resources that you need. And as Leslie says, it's commit because we're working company by company, organization by organization to look at your goals from now until 2020. So any of us here at STEM Connector, Million Women Mentors, will work with you and your teams. And as Ford said so well, what are you doing externally and what are you doing internally to really move the needle big time? I think all we can say with appreciation, this is the largest movement for careers and gosh knows the strong appreciation on International Women's Day. And with that, we'll conclude our webinar. Let's continue to celebrate, to hold each other up, and advance the movement. Thanks, all.